In 1970, I turned nine years old. I thought it was the dawn of the truly modern era. America had two successful lunar landings under our belts, and we'd recently given the communist North Vietnamese a first-class shellacking during their failed Tet Offensive in the South. I was busy building model airplanes, playing Little League, watching Saturday morning cartoons, and being an all-American nine-year-old. The top songs on the radio and eight-track tapes were Mungo Jerry's In the Summertime, the Jackson 5's I'll Be There, Lola by the Kinks, and at the top of the charts was, ironically, Simon and Garfunkel's Bridge Over Troubled Water. What I could not know was that the triggers of change had already been pulled in the 1960s, and the hammer was about to drop in the 1970s. There is a lag between actions that affect social change and that change taking effect. But the symptoms had been obvious and the infection deep. The illness was about to set in. There were six events that really set about the change of the 1970s, and five of them had already occurred in the 1960s. These were the assassinations of John F. Kennedy, Martin Luther King, and Bobby Kennedy. The My Lai Massacre and the aforementioned Tet Offensive. The sixth would be the Watergate scandal. Kennedy's assassination had put Lyndon Baines Johnson in the White House, which changed the direction of everything. Although Johnson's focus on the civil rights movement bore fruit by 1970, the death of Martin Luther King left the movement in lesser hands. Meanwhile, Johnson's management of the Vietnam conflict was so bad that he did not even seek re-election in 1968. The final blow for his administration was when news anchor Walter Cronkite often referred to as the most trusted man in America, made his famous statement during the Tet Offensive about not being able to see how we could win in Vietnam. Despite having dealt the Communist North a crushing defeat, Cronkite's mischaracterization resonated with a public that was tired of the Vietnam conflict and really didn't understand what the war was about. The first real seeds of doubt as to America's greatness had been cast. A military draft during a shooting war with unclear goals had already begun to expand what was called the generation gap, a disconnect between the unapologetically patriotic middle class, many of whom had served in the military, often in World War II or Korea, and the teenagers that were now going to college in record numbers, often just to avoid getting drafted. America was at the height of its affluence, and the generation entering early adulthood had mostly known only peace and prosperity. The counterculture was gaining traction, and many of the young men who did not want to go to Vietnam hid out in academia, on college campuses with draft deferrals, sometimes brazenly burning their draft cards. They often found the protected environment to their liking, and many of them made academia a career choice. But now it was 1970. The war was slowly winding down as the new President Nixon started troop productions and began turning the war over to the South Vietnamese. But old sins cast long shadows, and the events of the 1960s were about to manifest themselves in the 70s. 1970 got off to an inauspicious start when on, ironically, April 13th, Apollo 13 had an internal explosion that wrecked the mission. Although NASA did an incredible job of rising to the emergency and returning the crew safely, it had kicked off the 1970s with a failure of America's flagship national project, the space program. There was some glory to be had in rising to an incredibly challenging emergency, but not everyone was impressed. Many Americans were already beginning to question the vast sums of money going to NASA when there were so many other problems at home and the Vietnam War was still going on. President Nixon saw the lunar program as a Kennedy project, but he and Congress knew that such a high-profile project could not be allowed to end in failure. Since the Apollo missions were already funded through Apollo 17, they continued through till the end of 1972, but the last three lunar missions were canceled. This was a harbinger of things to come. In early 1970, the My Lai Massacre had made it into the news, and on the 17th of November, a court-martial charging 14 officers, including the general of the unit involved, was convened. He was charged with suppressing information related to the incident. Most of the charges were later dropped, and a brigade commander was the only high-ranking officer who stood trial on charges relating to the cover-up. 
he was acquitted a year later. In fact, the only person convicted was a junior officer, 2nd Lieutenant William Calley Jr. Even his sentence was eventually commuted. This left America with a sullen feeling, and for the first time, the general populace was really starting to wonder about the rightness of the mission in Vietnam, as well as the conduct of the American troops. Other stories of American atrocities, the use of napalm, and so many other moral and practical questions were being raised. Many celebrities, including World War II and Korean War veterans, were actively criticizing U.S. policy, and that would become an even bigger issue in a couple of years. On the heels of this came the Kent State shootings. Thirteen unarmed college students were hit by bullets from the Ohio National Guard at Kent State University in Kent, Ohio during a mass protest against bombings in Cambodia by the United States military. The shooting lasted only 13 seconds, but four of the students died. On August 24, 1970, Four student radicals at the University of Wisconsin-Madison campus committed the Sterling Hall bombing as a protest against the university's research connections with the U.S. military during the Vietnam War. It resulted in the death of a university physics researcher and injuries to three others. One of the perpetrators is still at large to this day. 1971 started with Don McLean's release of the iconic song American Pie. There was some bright news as Apollo 14 made a successful lunar landing, but at the same time the U.S. government ran up its second largest budget deficit since 1927. The only larger one had been in 1968 to fund the first lunar landings. On the upside, the voting age was lowered to 18 for federal elections, so now at least the voting age reflected the draft age. The year was actually starting to look up when in June the Pentagon Papers were leaked to the New York Times. The reports revealed many facts about the war in Vietnam that the public were unaware of. This caused many U.S. citizens to lose trust in the United States government. The general feeling was that the government had misled the public and withheld the truth. It was the same year that Australia and New Zealand announced that they were pulling their troops out of Vietnam. Shortly after that, Disney World in Orlando, Florida opened up, but only two months later, Roy Disney died. Walt had passed away in 1967. This seems minor, but it was emblematic of the death of American innocence. Nineteen seventy two would begin with one of the biggest political scandals in American history, the Watergate break in. Ironically, as the news of it unfolded, Nixon went on to a landslide re election victory. More pop culture resistance to traditional Americana surfaced, such as the 1972 visit of American actress Jane Fonda to Hanoi. She was the daughter of one of the most famous and patriotic American actors in Hollywood, Henry Fonda, who himself was a World War II veteran having served as an officer in the U.S. Navy. She even went so far as to meet with seven American POWs being held in North Vietnamese prisons. She claimed on camera that their military operations violated the rules of war and that they should be tried as war criminals. This type of thinking was becoming more common with Americans, especially in the entertainment industry. Besides fond of personalities as far removed as singers Joan Baez, Marvin Gaye, and Pete Seeger, along with boxer Muhammad Ali, as well as World War II veterans Charlton Heston, Norman Mailer, and Rod Serling, were openly against the war. Although not yet mainstream, the sentiment was growing and was part of the manifestation of America's eroding self-confidence. On September 5th of 1972, Arab terrorists took 11 Israeli hostages at the Munich Olympics. Although not directly an American problem, world terrorism was on the rise, and the inability of modern countries to stop it had everyone concerned. It was a depressing story with a sad ending that had everyone feeling dour. It didn't help that the image of Jews being murdered in Germany opened some very sore wounds. The attack did initiate the development of dedicated and trained counter-terrorist units in the West. But as bad as things were, they were not insurmountable. They were, however, about to get worse. Much worse. 1973 might be considered the beginning half of the turning point. It started off strong in January with the signing of the Paris Peace Accords that were supposed to end the war in Vietnam. 
American forces started coming home and the American prisoners of war were returned to the United States. Later in the year, the military draft in America was ended. In February, the U.S. Congress voted to hold hearings on the Watergate scandal. They ran from May until August and were televised live. Also in February of 1973, about 200 Oglala Lakota Native Americans and members of the American Indian Movement occupied Wounded Knee in South Dakota, taking 11 hostages and demanding that the U.S. government start investigating broken treaties, the Bureau of Indian Affairs, and all of the South Dakota Sioux reservations. The occupation lasted 71 days, during which time they both negotiated with and exchanged regular gunfire with federal agents. In May, the group surrendered and government officials agreed to start investigations, as demanded. In May, NASA launched Skylab, and several large pieces literally fell off during the launch. NASA was back in rescue mode, trying to cobble together a mission to salvage the space station. They were able to quasi-fix it, but the resulting repairs made it look like something out of a redneck trailer park. He was missing an entire solar array and needed a reflective blanket to cover a missing skin panel. It only hosted three missions and became somewhat of a national embarrassment before its orbit decayed and it came home like a boss, but more on that later. A cultural phenomenon that matured about this time was a ridiculous battle of the sexes tennis match between 55-year-old Bobby Riggs and 29-year-old Billie Jean King. King handily defeated the almost three-decade older Riggs, yet it was the most watched tennis match in history up to that time. In October, the 1973 Arab-Israeli war erupted when Israel was attacked by a coalition of Arab states led by Egypt and Syria. The war took place mostly in Sinai and the Golan, with some fighting in African Egypt and Northern Israel. America gave aid to its ally, Israel. But in response to that U.S. support, the Arab members of OPEC, led by Saudi Arabia, decided to reduce oil production by 5% per month. This, in turn, led President Nixon to authorize a major allocation of arms supplies and over $2 billion in appropriations for Israel. The Arab response to this aid was to declare an embargo against the United States, later joined by other oil exporters causing the 1973 energy crisis. Also in October, Vice President Spiro Agnew resigned due to pending charges for corruption when he was the governor of Maryland. He was replaced by Gerald R. Ford. In December, a missing 18 and a half minute segment from one of Nixon's White House recordings was discovered, further eroding his standard with the American public as well as Congress. Gas lines, fuel shortages, a resigning vice president, and a president with a rapidly eroding image had left America in a serious state of distrust of the government and a generally sullen mood. Nineteen seventy four was the second half of the turn that set America on a course into ambiguity. The Arab oil embargo was in full effect until March, which was a major drag on the economy, and unemployment was on the rise. The rise in inflation but stagnant economic growth became known as stagflation. In March of 1974, following the fuel crisis, the 55 mile per hour national speed limit was put into effect. This was universally unpopular and made folk heroes out of cannonball road racers and truck drivers who developed creative ways to elude law enforcement. TV shows like Moving On and songs like Convoy in 1975 led to the trucker craze and movies like The Gumball Rally and later on Cannonball Run. The impact on the American auto industry was catastrophic. Plants closed as Chevrolet, the top selling brand in the U.S. during the embargo, built more than two and a half million vehicles in 1973, but by 1975 production had crashed to just over 823,000 units. Ford fell equally hard, its factories turning out 780,000 fewer cars than in 1975 than it had in 1973. Meanwhile, Japanese car company sales tripled as they had specialized in smaller, more economical cars. One bright spot was that many jobs were created when the Alaska pipeline began construction. But despite what little good news there was, on August 9th, President Nixon resigned. 
His crimes were pretty well exposed and he was made aware that he would not survive an impeachment. His resignation saved both him and the nation from an ugly impeachment process. Gerald Ford became president and almost immediately wrote Nixon a full pardon before any of the charges were even brought to save the country from a long and ugly trial. In September, President Ford, a World War II veteran, issued a conditional amnesty for draft dodgers. To qualify, the president announced, they needed to work for up to two years in a public service job. This was confusing and even offensive to many Americans who were already wondering what was happening to traditional American values. Many saw it as correcting an injustice while others saw it as rewarding cowardice and a slap in the face to all who had served, especially the draftees. So, while music by ABBA, The Beach Boys, and David Bowie topped the charts, and popular movies such as The Sting, The Exorcist, Papillon, and Blazing Saddles were doing well in theaters, America drifted into 1975. 1975 held a blow for Americans like no other. A lot happened that year, but none of it compares to the fall of Saigon. The images of helicopters carrying away the lucky evacuees from rooftops and courtyards, then having those same helicopters pushed overboard into the sea, followed by pictures of dangerously overcrowded refugee ships, was so far removed from the images of victorious Marines raising a flag on Mount Suribachi that it was hard to believe the two events were only separated by 30 years. Congress's refusal to live up to its commitment to help South Vietnam if the North invaded left us scarred, both emotionally and politically. For the first time since 1918, the world saw America as an unreliable ally. National prestige had hit an all-time low. This was the pivot. Although the American military was never defeated on the battlefield in Vietnam, and when we left, the war was won, the peace was lost. Only two years after we pulled out, the North invaded the South, and we did nothing. As a nation, we really did not understand what had just happened, nor why, but we had a strong feeling that America was losing its way, and perhaps already had lost it. And for better or worse, we have never really been the same since. Nineteen seventy six was America's bicentennial year. We were two hundred years old as a nation. There were parties and celebrations and a huge Fourth of July. But other than that, there was actually not a lot going on. We painted damn near everything red, white, and blue and had bicentennial minutes on TV and the stagflation was still a thing. We did unveil our new space shuttle and a little independent film called Rocky came out. A couple of geeks started a company called Apple, but uh, it didn't sell fruit. At the end of the year, sick of the swamp that is Washington politics, America elected a Washington, D.C. outsider to be president, former Georgia governor and peanut farmer, Jimmy Carter. We the people, in order to form a more perfect union, establish justice, ensure domestic tranquility.
We started losing a lot of popular celebrities in 1977, perhaps the biggest of whom were Elvis Presley, Charlie Chaplin, Joan Crawford, Bing Crosby, Groucho Marx, and the young and up-and-coming Freddie Prince. A new generation of movie makers was beginning to start their ascent with little movies like Star Wars, Close Encounters of the Third Kind, and Saturday Night Fever. New York City had a 25-hour blackout that exposed just how vulnerable our power grid was, and what happened when it went down, well, it was not pretty. Inflation was up to 6.5% and stagflation was still a thing. In September of 1977, our new president did two things that showed he was no strong man. First, he signed a treaty which began the process of giving the Panama Canal back to the Panamanians years before the existing treaty required it. So long as Panama signed a treaty guaranteeing the permanent neutrality of the canal. And secondly, he gave full pardons to the draft dodgers. President Ford had given them a conditional amnesty, but President Carter gave them full pardons so they would have no criminal records. 1978 was pretty quiet by comparison, but suffered from slow growth. American car companies were trying to recover as the Japanese car companies continued to grow like juggernauts. The airline industry was deregulated, which allowed new airlines, often of dubious quality, to pop up and created a marketplace that the formerly protected legacy carriers were ill-equipped to handle. It's also the year that I enlisted in the Army while still in high school. Nineteen seventy nine was the year that in rapid succession the Shah of Iran fell and we had the Three Mile Island nuclear power plant accident. Everyone panicked about the disruption of the fuel and energy supply, which triggered another fuel crisis. It was in July of that year that I graduated high school and reported for active duty with the Army. It was about then that President Jimmy Carter gave his now infamous Malaise speech. Although a depressing speech that lamented consumerism, it did reflect the overall dour mood of the nation. On July 11th, 1979, Skylab came home and luckily, despite showering Australia with large chunks of debris, didn't kill anyone. In fact, by this time, mocking the ailing Skylab and poking fun at NASA's folly had become sort of an odd national pastime. The agency that had been the veritable image of American technological prowess only seven years earlier was now the stuff of jokes. But America had a major indignity brewing on the horizon. On November 4th, Iranian college students stormed the U.S. Embassy in Tehran and took 52 Americans hostage. They would not be released until 444 days later. There was a botched rescue attempt in 1980 that probably more than anything else helped bring down Jimmy Carter's presidency. And to round out the 1970s, on December 24th, 1979, six days before the end of the decade, the Russians invaded Afghanistan. The decade, which had begun with the all too apropos song, Bridge Over Troubled Water, ended with another ironically titled song, Pink Floyd's Comfortably Numb. After the 1970s, America would never be the same unwaveringly patriotic nation full of self-confidence and unrestrained vigor. Our national prestige was greatly damaged after we had shown weakness and unreliability when we turned our backs on South Vietnam, which, even if technically incorrect, left Americans feeling that we had lost our first war. We had capitulated to a second-rate dictator and effectively surrendered the Panama Canal. We had 52 hostages being held by a hostile regime, and to put a cherry on top, the Russians were on the march in Afghanistan. The 80s couldn't get here soon enough. America's climb back to economic, political, and military strength would come about soon under a different president, along with the restoration of much of our self-confidence. But we would never again have the level of trust in our government, and maybe not even in ourselves. Perhaps we needed to learn that even America has its limits. Having lived through it, 
I'm given to think that Sir John Glove's treatise on the fate of empires held true, for nothing would ever truly be the same in America.